I'd like to have you welcome my wife, Drup Goodman, and um, as she teaches us today. Um, if you've not seen her teach the word, you're in for a treat, uh, all of you that are tuning in around the world through streaming. Also, I would say this, um, you on Facebook, go ahead and just share this or like this and share it with your friends so that they can also uh, partake of, of her teaching. I know it will bless you. So, Am I on? Oh, yeah, here we are. I'm always on. Woohoo! <laughs> you know, I, I, I woke up with this message. I know Mandy and Darren have been praying and, and that I would get a message, and I did get one this week. So pretty much a miracle that I put it together so quickly. Um, but I want to encourage you in this, is when it comes to feeding, feeding yourself. You know, some people feed their car better than they feed their body. And sometimes that can be the same thing with our spiritual life. Sometimes we can just be like a catfish and eat whatever comes our way. But you know what? We need to be like the eagle. The eagle flies high. The eagle is selective in what he eats. He doesn't just suck off the bottom. He doesn't just open wide his mouth and eat whatever comes his way. He is selective. And, and I really, really am thankful for the revelation of the Word of God that God has given to this ministry and to, to us as a couple because we have a grass-fed steak every Sunday topped with organic Brussels sprouts. I know a lot, maybe not a lot of people like Brussels sprouts. Organic Brussels sprouts and organic beans and, and, and a, a, a salad from the garden. This is what we get here. And, and, and I'm just so thankful for that. And today, I would really love it that you open your heart, that you really, really listen with your heart, not just with your ears. And don't let it go in and out the other, because this is an important message that I have. It is called the ventriloquist in you. I know that sounds like a weird thing. The ventriloquist in you. I do know what a ventriloquist is. You know? <laughs> I know because you're all looking at me like, what? <laughs> I know that, uh, that it means a person who can speak or utter a sound so that it, they seem to come from somewhere else. You know, you all know the ventriloquist, the guy that has the two or three or four Muppets and and the funny thing is, he can tell you anything, say anything to you, and you laugh like crazy. He can tell you you're, you're screwed up, you're weird, you're, you're, you're this, you're that. And, and nobody takes him seriously because it's coming from a doll that sits beside him. And he can get away with anything. But here's the thing. There's a voice on the inside of us that resounds on the inside of us. And... And that is what I want to deal with today, is our core belief system, because we all have it. And I'm not talking about that you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about that. That is a for sure thing. You all have that. And I'm not talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, but I'm talking about the voice that, that says things to you on the inside of you, that ventriloquist that is on the inside of you. And... and and I want to I want to say a little bit more about the ventriloquist. So he's an, he's an especially an entertainer who makes the voice appear to come from a dummy of a person or an animal. So in essence, is an act of a stagecraft. So is this how sometimes we behave? Speaking out loud, things we think that sound good or are acceptable to others, or things that we have heard others say. All the while, there's another voice speaking on the inside of us. That is our true voice, our true core system. And that is the voice that you live by. That is the voice that brings the fruit in our life. Amen? Or is your ventriloquist a voice filled with buts? Yeah, but. 
Do you all say that sometimes? Yeah, but. That's the only but you can shrink in your life. Yeah, but. Well, how about doing it this way? Yeah, but. Yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what about? And sometimes you talk yourself out of some things that God wants you to have in your life. Sometimes you talk yourself out of things that you need to change in your life because of the but that you talk about. So if our core belief system is contrary to God's plan and purposes, we will never manifest God's purpose in our life. We will always be stuck in that core ventriloquist voice that is on the inside of us. Until we change our core belief system, nothing will change. I'm going to look at Mark. Let's go to Mark 5. I'm going to give, I'm going to give you lots of examples. Lots of examples of people in the Bible that had a core belief system. And because of that core belief system, they were where they were at in life. And I just love it how Jesus came on the scene and, 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 and interrupted that core belief system in many people. Completely interrupted it. And was able to, 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 to have them look at, a, a, look at their issues and what they were dealing with in a completely different light. And their whole life changed. Have you ever heard the statement that actions speak louder than words? Have you ever heard that statement? Sometimes you see, you, enter, you, you encounter a person and they, they say all this stuff. All this stuff. But then you step back and you look at their actions and you see something different. In that, you are able to decipher their core belief system. Because what they do is what they believe, not what they say. So Mark 5.25, we're going to look at the woman that has an, she had an issue. And maybe her issue was more than bleeding. Let's think about that. Maybe her issue and her core belief system was that she believed that doctors could help her. To a point where she spent all of her money. So in verse 25, it says, A woman in the crowd had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much suffering at the hands of many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was not helped at all. But instead, she had become worse. So her belief system had brought her to this point. It had brought her to a point where she was worse. Verse 27. She had heard, here comes a different voice. She had heard reports about Jesus. And she came up behind him in the crowd, and she touched his, his, his outer robe, for she thought, here's her voice, here's a new voice, because she had what? Heard. She had heard something different. She had not been down at the cafe talking about the physicians that didn't work anymore. She had not been looking at text messages that said, you know what, you need to go to this doctor. This one is the one that's going to help you. This is the one that's not going to take all your money. But she heard something different. She heard about Jesus. So then her voice changes and she says, If I just touch his clothing, I will get well. So that was an instant core belief system change that happened in that woman. I want to have that happen. I want to have anything in, on the inside of me that is not lining up. I want to have an instant change. And you know what? The only one that can do that in our lives is the Holy Ghost. Nobody else can, ha can cause a change like that in our hearts. Verse 29, immediately her flow of blood was dried up. So here's the product. Here's the product of her core belief system change which is that her blood dried up and she felt in her body and knew without any doubt that she was healed of her suffering. 
And immediately Jesus, recognizing in, in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and he said, Who touched me? Who touched me? He felt it. And we'll keep, we'll, we'll keep going down to 34. He said to her, Daughter, your faith, your personal trust and confidence in me has restored your health. See, it wasn't Christ. It was her faith and her belief in Christ that healed her. You get that? Her deciding to change because of what she heard manifested that healing in her life. Amen? So in order for her to change, she had to hear something different. You know how faith comes, right? Exactly. Faith comes by hearing the word of God and hearing it some more and hearing it some more. And that's how you and I, all of, all of us, have changed from what we were 20 years ago. We're not the same people, are we? I know I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago. My belief system is not the same. But then she had to change the voice of her heart, which was her belief system. As that happened, her faith was activated and produced a healing. Check that out. Isn't that so good? So in essence, she received more than physical healing. She received a core belief system change. And that, you know, we, the Bible doesn't talk about what happened to her afterwards. But who knows? Who knows what, she, what that woman could have done with that, the, with that change in her life. See, learn to listen to what you are saying without moving your lips. Listen to that inner voice inside of you. What is it saying on a regular basis to you? Is it positive or is it negative? Is it, you know, I, I don't think I could ever do that. I could never have that. Or is it, you know what? I am the apple of God's eye. I can move forward. I can change. I can change this thing in my life that has been plaguing me for several years. I can do it. And this is how I'm going to do it. I can change. Change is good, right? Change is good. Luke 6.45 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So we understand that the word is like a seed, right? The word is a seed. And as we take time to let that word go in, that seed go in, it will germinate. And there will be things in, your, in our lives that we will go, Wow, you know, pfft, I don't do this anymore. I don't think like that anymore. I used to think like this. I used to speak like that. I used to do this. I, used, I don't do that anymore. What happened? Well, the seed of the word came in. That is called effortless change. I mean, that's the power of the word. That's the benefit of the word that the world cannot see, unfortunately. That is such a huge benefit. Let's go to Judges. I'm going to give you lots of examples of people that had voices. They were not schizophrenic. <laughs> they were not schizophrenic, but they had a voice. And we all have a voice. Judges 6, 11. We're going to Gideon. I know all of you know who Gideon is. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree at Oprah, which belonged to Joash, the Abyssinite, and his son Gideon was beating wheat in the wine press. Now the story goes on ahead of that is that the Israelites had done evil in the eyes of God. So therefore the Midianites had taken over. So they were all broke, busted, and disgusted because of that. You know, there's a cause and effect of everything, isn't there? So he was in the wine press instead of the threshing floor, and he was hiding. He was hiding from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appears to him, and he says to him, the Lord is with you. 
Really? Are you kidding me? The Lord is with me? Look what's happening. He says, the Lord is with you. Oh, brave man. That didn't look very brave, did it? But Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why is all this happening to us? The proverbial. And where are all the, wor the wondrous works which our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hand of the Midian. Don't we always blame God? Isn't there, some, isn't there a voice on the inside of all of us, somewhere deep on the inside of us that says, but God, why, 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 why this, why that? That's blaming God. Let's keep going, because the, the Lord will show you what, what I'm trying to tell you here. The Lord turned to him and he said, Go in the strength of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? But Gideon said to him again, here's another excuse, but please, Lord, how am I to rescue Israel? Behold, my family is the least. Here's that voice again. Here's his core belief system. I'm the least. I'm the brokest. I'm the bustedest. I'm the, I'm the est of everything. That's, that's the voice of Gideon. I'm insignificant. And I am the youngest. Whammy. I'm the smallest. In my father's house. But the Lord answered him, and he said, I will certainly be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites as if they were only one man. How about waking up with that voice in the morning? Instead of all these wares and woes. See, believe it or not, that voice steers your life. That voice will steer your life in a direction. And, and, and you've heard of people. You have heard of people that have done things and they look at you and they say, I don't even know why I did, did this. I don't even know how I ended up here. I have no idea. Well, I know. And you know. There was a voice that you listened to that was not a true voice. It was a lie. And you went ahead and you listened to that thing. And as you listened to it, you, you propelled your life in that direction. Because when you listen, you begin to speak what you hear. And that's what happens to people. They speak, they hear, and they speak. The voice you hear the loudest is your own. And this is the voice that your core belief system is based on. Imagine that. Be honest with yourself. Nothing changes without truth. If you don't tell the truth, you'll be fixing a lie. In a relationship, you know, this, it took me and Darren several years to live in our truth, to be able to speak our truth, to be able to say, you know what, I don't like this about you, and you need to change it. It took years for us to be able to do that to where the other, the corresponding of the other spouse was, you know what, you're right. Or the corresponding was, Rah! I'm going to come right back at you because you just came at me. I'm coming right back at you. Now that's immaturity. That's immaturity. Because we are on the same team. Took me a long time to see that. That he was my teammate. He was not, he, he was not Hercules that I needed to beat and, and, and kill in my life. <laughs> and now, listen, now uh, we are so well trained in it, I can look at him and I can say, hey, you know what? I don't like that. And I don't want you to do that again. It doesn't happen very often anymore because we kind of took all the dislikes out. We wrote or rooted them out. It's possible, I'm telling you. It is possible. I've lived it. 
But when we don't live in our truth, when we don't speak the truth to our spouses, we, we get this tumor that starts growing on the inside of us. If you're never allowed to say and speak your mind, that, that, that thing is going to start growing. And it's growing, and it's growing, and it's growing. And that ventriloquist is, he's Ahmed the freaking terrorist now. <laughs> I'm telling you, Ahmed is going to come out. And here's the sad thing, is when we cannot speak our, our truth in our relationships, we're going to hurt somebody. Our blood pressure is going to go way up. Our heart's not going to beat right. Why do you think Jesus always told the truth? Get thee behind me, Satan. Oh, you're a bunch of brutal vipers. Let me come and beat you up because you're, you're, you're selling stuff in the, in the temple. Truth. Truth, truth is, is what we have to live in and we have to cultivate in our re relationships. And that true voice. When your husband says something, well, what do you think about this? Don't say what you think he likes to hear. Speak your truth. And there's great freedom. Great freedom in that. That was a side note. Once you realize the truth, it will set you free. Isn't that what the Bible says? There's, there's a many facets to that. It's multifaceted. It's not just the truth of the gospel. that will set you free so you could go to heaven. There's other things in our life, right? So Gideon spoke the truth of his heart. His core belief was that he was not able to change anything for his people. That was his truth. He was just telling the truth. But that does not mean that that truth can't change. If it's negative, if it's, if it's disabling, if it's, ne if, it's, if it's holding you back. You know, your truth might be, um, I don't think I can ever go beyond my income today where I'm at today. That might be your truth. But that is subject to change. Amen. If you put other things inside of you that will change that truth. And that, that truth become, you know what? God is able, so therefore I am able. Another truth, God, he, he delights in my prosperity. That's a truth from the Bible that I can take and put on the inside of me, right? So once he spoke to this angel, the angel was able to correct his wrong belief system, which resulted in him ha saving Israel for that time, right? That's what Gideon did. He went and, he went and um, killed a bunch of people with a donkey bone. I know, we, you know, I know we're not supposed to kill people today, but that's what he did. And, and he had victory. And, and and he could have chosen to say, you know what, angel? Let me just, let me just give it to you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one more time. <laughs> I am the youngest. <laughs> I am the leastest. <laughs> I am all the estes in, in, in my family. Ain't no way. He could have done that, but he chose not to. He chose to go and, 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 and shift his truth from what the angel told him and accepted it and did it. Amen? Let's go to John chapter 5. One more, two or three more examples I'm going to give to you. John chapter 5, verse 2. You getting this? Is this good? Because I think it's pretty retarded to learn the word, to come to church, to listen to the word, and go home and never change. I think that's pretty retarded. I think we need to always be changing, always be growing, right? And I think our, our uh, spouses are the best um, meter for our lives. If you don't have a spouse, you should have a friend that can speak into your life or has an access to say things to you like, hey, enough of that. It's time to grow out of that. It's time that you change that, right? 
There's safety in that. Okay, John 5, 2. This is the Bethesda healing. Now in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, there's a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Aramic, Bethsida, Bethesda, excuse me. Having five port porticos, in these porticos lay a great number of people who were sick, blind, lame, withered, waiting for the stirring of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down into the pool at appointed seasons and stirred up the water. The first one to go in after the water was stirred was healed of his disease. Now there was a certain man there who had been ill for 38 years. Imagine that. I, I, I'm telling you, being around sick people, there's a culture there. There's a flora. There's a flora of inertia of always talking about the sickness. That's all they talk about. Go to a cancer clinic and you will see several people sitting right there and the flora and the microbiome and the culture is, well, how, well so how did, how did your, how much CCs did you get today? Or is your, is your uh, port, is your port, is it infected? Is your hair falling out yet? How much pain are you in today? That's all they talk about. And it is probably the most unhealthy environment that any sick people person can be in. You, at, as a sick person, you need to step out of that environment and get into an environment. Hey, let's go with kids. <laughs> hang with children. Seriously, hang with something else other than sick people because you will be sick. You will just, you will be stirred in that pool. And there's that pool right there. The Bethesda pool, there was just a stirring of lame, blind, and sick people. So this poor man for 38 years, he'd been in this environment. So when the healer shows up, listen, look at this. When Jesus notices them, notices him lying there, helpless, knowing that he had been there in this condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? Heck no. No. I want another, I, I want another IV. <laughs> Do you want to get well? What is his core belief system? Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. How sad is that? I have nobody to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up and while I'm coming, here's all the excuses. All the excuses. But, but Jesus, don't you know I've got cancer? Don't you know how powerful that is? Imagine that. But when I'm coming to get into it myself, someone else steps on, down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, you know what, let's, let's bypass all that. We're, we're going we're gonna to play a skipping game here, baby. <laughs> no, more, no more jumping into the stirred water. But right now, just get up and pick, pick up your stuff and walk. Can you imagine his amazement? That, to be honest with you, that right there is almost an overriding of his, his belief core, core belief system. Jesus overrode it. He did. It's like his hardware completely got a completely new hardware because his software was all messed up. Imagine that. That right there is a miracle. That's a miracle. And those can still happen. Those can still happen. But after the miracle, we still have to change. Yep. We still have to grow. Yep. We still have to work. We still have to, have to live this life that we live in today. Yep. Amen? Amen? See, your mouth decides which one of your thoughts will live. Bingo. Your mouth decides which one of your thoughts will live. Your mouth gives birth to your thoughts. Imagine that. 
So when you're talking, I know what you're thinking. I know exactly what you're thinking when you're talking. So get good at listening. Let's go to 1 Samuel 1.8. Is this good? Yes. All right. This is just line up on line. Line up on line. There's so many, many examples in the Bible that we can take and learn from. Because it is better to learn from somebody else's mistake than make them your own. Isn't it? You know, there are just some people that are just so stubborn. They have to make all those <laughs> mistakes. All those mistakes. And they can live for years in that. Until one day they might make, wake up and go, you know what? Enough is enough. Enough is enough. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 8. Then Elkanah, her husband, and her, this is Hannah. Hannah. Why do you cry? Why are you whining and moping all the time? Why do you not eat? Why are you so sad and discontent? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Ladies, take note. Your husband is better for you than ten sons. It's the truth. Your sons and your daughters will leave. But your husband is with you forever. So he is number one. He is number one. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he is number one. Children number two. That's, that's how it is. Husband number one. Children number two. Because when husband is number one, children will always be good. Got it? That's a side note. <laughs> So Hannah, verse 9, so Hannah got up after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his seat beside the doorpost, probably drinking a bottle of whiskey, of the temple. <laughs> was that a flyby? <laughs> Hannah was greatly distressed, and she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. She made a vow, saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look at the affliction of your maidservant, and remember, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never touch his head. Verse 12. Now it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. And Hannah was speaking in her heart. See, we don't always have to, we don't always have to, pray our prayers out loud, you can pray them inside. You can talk to God on the inside. She was speaking in her heart, her mind. Only her lips were moving, and her voice was not heard. And that's why Eli thought she was drunk. Takes one to know one. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Eli said to her, how long, how long will you make yourself drunk? Get rid of your wine, lady. <laughs> Seriously. But Hannah answered, no, no, no. I am a woman with despairing spirit. I have not been drinking wine or any intoxicating drink, but I have poured my soul out before the Lord. I have poured my soul out. I've, my voice, my inner voice, I am pouring it out to God. This is the desire of my heart. I want a son. This is one of the good examples of a, a ventriloquist voice in the Bible. Because what Hannah was doing was good. Amen? It was right. The ventriloquist voice is your true voice. It is your true voice. This is your voice that gets prayers answered. Learn to live in the truth of God's word. Line your heart up with his truth and you will see results. Hannah saw results, didn't she? I, I hope you're getting a revelation of what I'm saying. Hannah got results with her true voice on the inside of her. Amen? Romans 8.26, look at this one, this is really good. Romans 8.26. This is about our victory in Christ. 
In the same way, the Spirit comes to us and helps us in our weaknesses. There's such a benefit. We do not know what to pray for or to offer or, to ho- or how to offer it as we should. But the Spirit himself, he knows. He knows our need at the right time. And he intercedes on our behalf with sighs and groanings too deep for words. That's the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. That is our aid, our comforter, our guide. And he can guide us. There's times I sit before God and I'm like, I don't even know what to pray. I don't know what to pray. I don't. So I just, I start praying in tongues. Because I know and I believe the Holy Spirit is there, is there for that, for that benefit. And before I know it, boom, it comes out. It comes out. In Luke 19, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus came to Jesus because of his ventriloquist voice. He said something on the inside of himself. Because what politician do you know that climbs a tree to check out somebody? Can you imagine Bill Clinton or President Obama climbing a tree just to see somebody that they want to see? No. But Zacchaeus had a voice on the inside of him and said, you know, I gotta, I've got to know who this man is. Who is this man that is causing all this rackets in this, in this town? Who is this man that heals all that are oppressed of the devil? Who is this man that has this wisdom that comes out of his mouth? I have got to see him. And he runs, and he jumps up a tree. Imagine that. That voice on the inside of him drove him. You know, if our voice is to drive us somewhere, it needs to drive us to Christ. Right? It it needs to drive us closer to God. Amen? See, a person without a strong inner voice um, no, he was a person without, with, with, with a strong inner voice compelling him. Zacchaeus. He believed in his heart and he spoke with his mouth. Amen. See, your words will tell others what you think, but your actions will tell them what you believe. Zacchaeus, I don't think he even knew at the time that he really believed who Christ was. But when Christ said, hey, you up there, Zacchaeus, you're going to come to, I'm going to come to your house now. I believe at that moment, Zacchaeus got the revelation. This is the Christ, the son of the living God. And I believe him and I accept him. Once he did that, he had a radical change. He changed radically. He said, you know what, Jesus? Anybody that I have overcharged, I'm going to repay them. I mean, something really changed in his heart. And that was all from a ventriloquist voice on the inside of him that says, I want to see who that man is. And he followed that voice. If you're going to follow that voice on the inside of you, make sure it goes to the right, right place. Not to prison, not to the um, rehab (laughs) or any of those places, but to Christ. Amen? In Romans 10, let's go there. I'm almost done. Had a lot of scriptures today because I love the word. I love the word. Romans 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is the word, the message, the basis of faith which we preach. See, there is always going to be word on the inside of you. There's always going to be word in your mouth. 
The question is, is which one is it going to be? Is it going to be my own idea, my own thoughts, my own way? Or is it going to be Yahweh? Is it going to be God's word? Or is it going to be Buddha? Or what is it? it there's always going to be something in our mind, heart, heart, and our, and our mouth. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, this is a principle, get this as a principle because I know you're all saved here. Recognize his power, authority, and majesty as God and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, our words and our, our core belief system either saves us or puts, her in, puts us in trouble. Only two ways to go. For with the heart a person believes, that's where the core belief system is, it's in the heart, in Christ as Savior, resulting in his justification, that is being made righteous, being freed of the guilt of sin, and made acceptable to God. And with the mouth he acknowledges, he confesses his faith openly, resulting and confirming his salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him, whoever adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him will not be disappointed. Do you know there's a lot of disappointed people on this planet? A lot of disappointed. A lot of disappointed youth on this planet. Why? Because they haven't put the right stuff in. The right stuff is not on the inside of them. And this is why we were so strong on our children learning the word of God for themselves. Not us constantly teaching it to them. We taught them by action. That's the best way to teach a child. But that they themselves understand the word of God. So now when things, come ha when things happen in their life, they're able to take it. They're able to handle it as, as young adults. When things happen around them, they're able to understand and discern and, and decipher of, what, of ma what manner of people are in front of them. It amazes me when Caleb will tell me, he'll say, well, mom, this man came up to me and blah, 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 and, and he goes, and this is what that man was dealing with. And I need to stay away from him. And I just think, I, uh, to me, that is worth more than any money on this planet is that my children discern who is around them that who they can hang with who they can who the, who what voice they can listen to that is worth so much to me and i'm sure you understand what i'm talking about is that they not go into a trap because of an influence influential voice that comes into their life because there are many there are many voices all over this world speaking things and saying things. Now, which one is the good one and which one is the bad one? And I'm grateful for God's wisdom. You need to speak wisdom over your children. Grind it in their heart. Amen? Now, the last person I want to talk about today is Paul. Paul is probably the one that had the most radical core belief system change on the planet. <laughs> in the Bible, at least. Paul's core belief system was that you and I needed to be killed. Because we were so-called infidel or whatever they call them. He truly, truly believed in the bottom of his heart that someone like you and I need to be killed. And it took Christ to knock him off his horse. Literally, not, not spiritually. He literally knocked him off his horse. And I'm telling you, there are some of us that need to be knocked off our horse. At some point or another in our life. We need to have this radical, bam, wow, wall, you hit a wall. And once you hit that wall, you go, 
this, I've been, this has been wrong. This, uh, my speech, my belief in this and this and this is wrong. I need to change it. And this is why Paul was blind. He couldn't see. He couldn't talk. For what, three days? I believe because the Holy Ghost said, you know what? I'm not going to allow him to, I'm not going to allow him to see anything and I'm not going to allow him to speak any of his stuff until I have changed everything on the inside of him. <laughs> because he's, I, there's, a, there's some serious stuff this man's going to be doing in this life. And I need him, I need him on my page. I need him on my page. And Paul, you all know the story. Paul so radically changed in a day, three days, like that. So much that, that Jesus' closest people did not believe him. They were afraid of him. They were scared to death of him. But once Paul had that core belief system change, look at his life. Look at what he was able to accomplish for God in the earth just because of one core belief system change. And that change was that Christ Jesus is Lord. That was it. I mean, he was radical for God. And I'm glad he did because we wouldn't have the whole New Testament without him. Right? <laughs> Second Corinthians 10.4. And this is my last scripture, and this is going to tie it all together. Talking about our weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. They're not physical weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What are those fortresses? Up here. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. I think sometimes, many times we think about that only as us coming up against what God says or what, God, what the Bible says. But this is really talking about our core belief system and what we think on a regular basis. What is going on in our, in our mind? What is it? I... I mean, God says that you are more than a conqueror. Do you believe that? Or are you constantly saying that you're weak and feeble? If you're saying you're weak and feeble, you are doing this. You are, you are, caught, you are exalting your thoughts above the knowledge of God. You get what I'm saying? Because most, let's face it, most of us are not, not fighting um, mega devils on a daily basis. Most of us have issues in our thought pattern and the way we think of ourselves. Yes. And that is that, that, again, that ventriloquist voice on the inside of us. Those are the thoughts. Let's finish the verse. They're arguments. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought. See, he's talking about thoughts. we got to take every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? That means what Christ says about me and you, we need to accept. We need to accept it. We need to embrace it. We need not be too hard, so hard on ourselves and, and, and bring out all the buts. Yeah, but, yeah, but. Christ loves you and I. Christ wants you and I to prosper. Christ wants you and I to walk in divine health and heal, healing and wholeness, S spirit, soul, and body. That is Christ's will for you and I. Now, for us to think or speak something different, we are arguing. We are arguing yep. with, with, uh, with God and, 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 and with what God says we should do and have. 
arguing, literally. And if we are, let's just say, you know what, God, I'm tired of arguing. I'm just going to agree with you. I'm just going to agree. <laughs> I am just going to agree that you want the best for me. You want me to prosper. You want my children to prosper. Your desire is for my children to enhance in the earth. Amen? How about this one? Your desire is that I have joy when I wake up in the morning. How about that one? Your desire is that there is peace. The Bible says that he will keep you in perfect peace as long as your thoughts are on him, right? Right? He will keep you in perfect peace as long as your thoughts are on him. Once your thoughts go somewhere else, shebang. Peace, you know, goes out the disposal. No more peace because we have chosen not to, to keep our thoughts where they should be, which is in line with truth of the word of God, right? So in essence... In essence, we either stay on God's team or we stay on, you know, whose team? And who is the deceiver? And let's not be so easily deceived. Let's not be so easy. If we change the way we think, we can change our belief system. Amen? Sometimes it's not the devil that we're warring against. It's our own faulty thinking, our faulty ventriloquist voice that causes us to grow and change. Amen. The words I say, listen to this one, the words I say decides the storm I enter or the storm I avoid. The words I say decide whether I enter the storm or I avoid the storm. The tongue is the rudder, isn't it? Your tongue is the rudder. And if you are not in the port you want to be in, Listen, if you're not in the port you want to be in, then let's begin to change the direction of our rudder. Amen? Let's change how we speak to one another. Let's change how we speak about the future. Do you look at your future? Do you look at your future with, with hope? With optimism? Or do you look at your future with dread? Which one is it? Are you optimistic about the future? Are you hopeful about the future? Are you excited about the next level, about the next step that is coming your way? Are you excited about 2018? Amen? Exactly. That's how we should look at life. It only gets better. I say it like this, I'm like a, a bottle of red wine. I just get better way with age. And we do. And we should get better with age. Us as older women, we should be there for the youngers. We should be there. We should be able to give something of ourselves. We should not be plumpers in a chair. We should be giving the wisdom that God has given us. Some through hard knocks, some through through experiences, some through obeying what the Word of God says. And God will always bring somebody in your life that you can give something to. Amen? He, and He does that for the purpose of you sowing. Because understand this, our life, all of our life is about seed, time, and harvest. If you understand that concept, you will do well in life. Seed, time, harvest. 
and you're going to be in, a, in, in each one of them at a different phase and a different time in your life. You're not always going to harvest and you're not always going to sow. You're always going to wait for time, but e those two is not always going to be. It's going to be one or the other and sometimes maybe both. And this is what the one, num another one, number one, we taught our children is always be conscientious of the seed you sow. I'm not talking money. I am not talking money. I'm talking attitude. I'm talking how you treat others. Be very conscientious. Doesn't matter how they're coming at you. You sow the right seed. Whether they're cheating you, whatever they're doing. Sow the right seed, and you will get the harvest. And now I see my children receiving the harvest, a much different harvest than many, many of their peers. And that is only because of the sowing they, had, they have done over the years. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands, everybody. Let's pray real quick. Father, I thank you for this word. Father, I thank you that this word has gone deep in our hearts, Lord. Father, we thank you for change in our lives. Father, we thank you we can take this word and we can apply it. Father, I thank you if there's things that we do need to change, that you will let us know, Holy Spirit. For you are the knower on the inside of us. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your guidance. Father, we thank you for your, your comfort. And Lord, we thank you that our eyes and our ears are open to your word. Father, I thank you for the production of the word in our life. I thank you, Father, that the harvest is coming of all the seeds that we have sown over the years, Lord. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your peace this week. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings this week. And Father, we thank you that we can hear your voice this week. We can be led by your voice this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's a good word, huh? Amen. Good word. Now let's take it. Yes. Let's take it and let's do it. Let's be doers. Not, not just, just hearers. Let be, let's be doers. And do what we've been taught. Husbands and wives, do what you've been taught. Singles, do what you've been taught. Amen? Amen. Well, we'd like to thank you for tuning in today. We're so glad that you were here with us. We'd love to see you again next Sunday. Come pe be prepared. Prepare your heart to hear the, the truth of the word next Sunday. And we'll see you back then. And remember this, one word from God can change your life. Thank you.